want to ask you some questions. This is uh, part of a series called Let Me Think. And this is the third and probably final. Uh, I think next week it's just going to be the end of the series, but it's going to be a testimony by a sister who um, I think you'll really appreciate the testimony. And Kaylin is also going to share his part, so it'll be related to this issue. Uh, in the first presentation, I asked a question. Thank you. You hear me now? Oh, yeah. Okay. I asked the question, um, is it important to take what God says for what it means? Yes. So, God's Word is absolute. The first presentation is, let me think absolutely. In other words, let me think the way God thinks. God thinks in absolutes. What did we find out in that presentation that third option is? Compromise. Compromise. So God's word is yea and amen, yes and no. The third option in the Christian's life, almost without exception, is the road of compromise. Okay? Then in our second presentation, which was let me think healthfully, the first question that I asked you before we began that presentation, which this is where we actually introduced the dress theme, I asked you the question, is dress our gospel? No. And it was unanimous. Every head in this room shook no. We've been studying, as my husband mentioned earlier, for a year, and this is the first time that we've directly addressed the, addressed the dress question. And so, no, we don't believe in salvation by dress. We don't believe, even though we had Brother Mamon Wilson here, we don't believe in salvation by diet. We don't believe in salvation by any other means, but by faith and submission to Christ. But there are some things that the Lord has told us to do as helpers on our way heavenward. And dress is one of them. And we're going to discover this tonight. Now, um, the, the title of tonight's is Let Me Think Modestly. Last week we talked about the health benefits of following God's health principles in dressing appropriately. We talked about covering the limbs. Talked about several aspects. Tonight we're going to talk about it more from the modesty perspective. Why does God tell us to dress the way that He did? And how did He tell us to dress? Does anybody know? Have you studied it? Have you studied to see, does God have principles and standards on the way a Christian should dress? Yes, He does. And we want to discover those tonight. Okay? We want to discover from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, everything that we do, everything that we eat, is for one reason or another. There's only two choices, right? It either glorifies me, or it glorifies God. Okay? So everything that you do in life... Who does it glorify? Ask yourself that question. If I put it on my body, if I put it in my body, if I go to a place, is this going to glorify me or will this glorify God? Ask yourself that question. There's not third options for the Christian. The Christian is yea and amen. We're going to look at several uh, passages of Scripture tonight. Most of them I have up here on the overhead so you can follow along there. If you'd like to turn with them, with me in your scriptures, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. We're going to look at several scriptures that deal particularly with the topic of dress. Unfortunately, ladies, this is talking mostly to us, and there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that later on in our study. This is speaking of women, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, or plaiting of the hair, or wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. Now that last phrase gets a lot of ladies riled up. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. I'm going to share a little bit of a personal testimony as we go on. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. We talked about this passage last week as well. 1 Timothy 2, 9. 
In like manner also that women adorn themselves with modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. We talked about that phrase, modest apparel. Katastelo, katastole, I think is, is the Greek word. It actually means to put down or to subdue. A woman should dress in a way to put down the passions of her brothers. It actually refers to a long flowing robe, the way a woman should dress. Next passage, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. This is a very controversial passage. We're going to talk about it a lot more this evening. That a woman should not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are, what that's, what's that word? Abomination. Abomination unto the Lord thy God. Raise your hand if you want to be an abomination to God. I don't think anybody in here wants to be. That's a very strong word. We need to unpack this and see what God is talking about. Okay? Evangelism, page 268. Read this carefully. Follow with me. One of the points upon which those newly come to the faith, and there's a lot of people in this room who have newly come to the faith. One of the points that you will need instruction on is the subject of dress. Let the new converts be faithfully dealt with. Are they vain in dress? Do they cherish pride of heart? The loyalty, the idolatry of dress is a moral disease. It must not be taken over into the new life. In most cases, submission to the gospel requirements will demand a decided change in the dress. And I found that to be true in my case. I'll share a little bit of a testimony later as we go on. But you know what? On behalf of my brothers and sisters, to those of you new in the faith, I apologize. Because most of you probably were not taught about Christian dress when you were brought into this church. Were you? Most of you were not. Okay. They preached it in the older sermons. Good. They did. That. They used to preach a lot of things in yes. the old sermons you don't hear these days. This is taken from the book Covered, written by Amy McKnight, and it's on page 87. The majority of Seventh-day Adventist women go to work, church, and school dressed in ways that would have gotten them arrested a century ago. It may be a sin of ignorance, but it is a sin nonetheless. If the Bible is true and God is changeless, then the way we are dressing is nakedness in the eyes of God. There really isn't any way around it. When Jesus said His last day church was naked, He was calling it as He divinely saw it. That's again taken from Amy McKnight's book, Covered. By the way, I'll give you a reference for this book at the end of the presentation. We'll, we'll show a, a screen with all the references on there. Now since... God started in the beginning with robes, and He's going to end up with robes, too. When we get to heaven, what's He going to give us? Robes. White robes, right? Okay. Since He started and is going to end with robes, how did we get from here to here? What happened? That's quite a difference. Okay? Who changed it? Where did it come from? If He dressed us in robes, where did pants come from? If you will look at your handout, I know that this is kind of small. We're not going to read this. I'm just putting it up there so that um, I would remember to cover this. And for those who are watching um, a DVD of this, I will post this on my webpage so that you can see it. It talks about where pants came from. They actually came from a group of people called the Gauls. All men used to wear robes. They were different from women's robes. We covered that last week. If you if you want to see that, it's on my webpage. Um, let me think helpfully. And so, um, anytime a bifurcated garment or skirt, bifurcated means two parts, anytime a bifurcated, bifurcated garment was worn, it was worn by men. Okay? And I'll just let you read the history. It's too much to go into in this class, but I wanted you to have the history of it. So it is on your handout, and it will be posted on the webpage. So that's the first question answered. Where did pants come from? The second question is, uh, who changed it? Who changed this method of dressing? I think most of us know, don't we? Evangel um, I think this is uh, Selected Messages, 3SM 3, 3 244. Informing the fashions of the day, he, who's he? Satan. Satan has a fixed purpose. So that answers the question, who changed it? Who changed fashion? 
Who is shaping fashion in today's society? Satan. Satan. And it says here that he has a what? Fixed purpose. purpose. What is his fixed purpose? We want to discover that tonight. Why is he doing this? Why has he changed the way people dress? Well, I want to, let's talk about something that we talked about in last week's study, and that was the law of first mention. Mm -hmm. We talked about studying. When we study a topic in the scriptures, where was it first mentioned in the scripture? Go back to where it was first mentioned, and usually you will find principle enough to direct you in the direction that you'll need to go with that topic. Okay? We also study in the light of the great controversy, and we study in the light of the sanctuary, which includes the cross. This is the law of first mention. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 16. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. I forgot to get my glasses out, so if I misspoke, speak a word here, you guys have to help me. Starting in verse 16, Unto the woman, this is God speaking, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth thy children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Again, that phrase gets a lot of women riled up. And it, it used to really get me riled up. I'd almost feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck. Verse 17, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat it all the days of thy life. Verse 18, Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Do you see in this passage that from the very beginning God had different roles for men and women? Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And we're not going to go into a detailed study of this, but I'd like to encourage you to go home on your knees and unpack this scripture. Ask the Lord to reveal to you clearly what those roles were what the roles of a man were, what the roles of a woman were. I want to read this to you. This is taken from volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 348. And it's talking about that phrase, Thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. A neglect on the part of woman to follow God's plan for her creation. An effort to reach for important positions which he has not qualified her to fill, leaves vacant the position that she could fill with acceptance. In getting out of her sphere, so does God have a sphere for the woman to be? Absolutely. He has a sphere for the man to be too. She loses true womanly dignity and nobility. When God created Eve, he designed that she should possess neither inferiority or superiority to, man, to the man, but that in all things she should be his equal. Reading on. The holy pair were to have no interest independent of each other, and yet each had an individuality in thinking and acting. But, after Eve's sin, as she was the first in transgression, the Lord told her. Who told her? The Lord. The Lord said, the Lord told her that Adam should rule over her. This was the birth of patriarchy. Who set this order? God. God said this is the way it's going to be. Okay? She was to be in subjection to her husband. And this was part of the curse. It was not God's original plan. It's part of the curse. In many cases, the curse has made the lot of woman very grievous and her life a burden. The superiority which God has given man, he has abused in many respects by exercising arbitrary power. Infinite wisdom devised the plan of redemption which places the race on a second probation by giving them another trial. I just have to say here, my husband and I were discussing something one evening. And uh, we didn't see eye to eye on the issue. 
And I finally told him, I said, sweetheart, you're going to have to make this decision. And I may not agree with you and I may cry. But I'll submit because you're the leader in this home. And you know what he told me? He almost started crying. He said, I know, but I don't want to abuse that either. You talk about melt. This lady just about melted, okay? I really appreciated that. My husband wants to do what's right, and I really respect that. But you know, before we married, I'm just going to share a brief testimony about your husband shall rule over you. Before we married, um, I had been single for 47 years, and I had, had, I had taken care of a lot of people. I know how to do a lot of stuff. I know how to do a lot of things that you guys know how to do. It's just the way I was raised. And um, we, were, we had to figure out how we were going to get my things up to North Dakota from Kentucky. And his thought was, well, after the wedding, which was on Friday, we'll spend the Sabbath together, and then Sunday we're going to load the truck, and then we're going to spend the next three days driving in different vehicles, me looking at his taillights. How would you like, ladies, to spend your honeymoon that way? <laughs> three days looking at the taillights of the truck your husband's driving. Uh -huh. I don't think so. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, I really don't like that plan. And so... But he was, you know, this is, we just got to work this out. And I said, well, listen, we need to pray about this because that I really don't, I mean, I waited 47 years. I don't want to spend my honeymoon looking at the taillights of the truck you're driving. So we prayed about it. I, I, I said, let's just pray about this. And so there happened to be a young man in Kentucky whose brother lived in Fargo who needed to ride up here. He didn't have a way to get up here. And so... He drove the U-Haul truck. I was going to pack a U-Haul truck and drive my stuff up here and fly back. Well, my husband-to-be said, no way. Well, guess what that did to me? I can't handle this. He thinks I can't handle this, and I was mad. Already? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot to learn, Elsie. <laughs> but here's the thing. I, I took it the way I thought, he thinks I can't handle this. So what does he think I am, some kind of wuss or something? You know, I was just, my mind was, you know, I just was gone. But when I finally calmed down, he said, I'm worried, I'm concerned. You're a woman by yourself, out on the road, in this truck. Guys are going to watch you and they're going to see there's a woman by herself in that truck. He said, I don't want you to be unsafe. Melt. <laughs> I melted again. Okay. <laughs> it just changed me. It, it helped me to realize that's what submission means. Mm -hmm. That's what his role means and my role means. And I began to heal on the inside from growing up with a very arbitrary daddy. You've, most of you heard my testimony. And so I didn't understand the man's role the way that the Lord intended for it to be. And so my pastor, I shared this story with my pastor back home, and he started busting out laughing. He said, this is going to be really good for you. <laughs> and it has been. It has been. And I, I have to say I appreciate my husband very much because he's taught me a lot. I've changed a lot. He's taught me a lot about the way a, a husband should be. And ladies... When we submit to our husbands, you know that it teaches them how to submit to the Lord. Because they're to be in submission to the Lord. And if we fight, what representation are we giving them? Fight. So we have a power, in essence, over our husbands. It's not over our husbands, but it's a power to influence our husbands by teaching them submission. Now, Satan knew who to target in Eden, and he knew why. Satan's goal is to blur that line between the male and the female, and he also exploited the fact that men are wired differently than women. Men are very visually aroused. Right, guys? Am I right? Okay. All right. Now, this is Solomon after he began to buckle to his many wives and concubines, and he began to worship a female goddess. This is what... Um, Prophets and Kings, page 58, says, His character, once noble and manly, became enervated or weakened and effeminate. 
So once he began to submit to all those wives and concubines and he began to worship a female goddess, it changed him. He wasn't a manly man anymore. I don't know about you ladies, but I like manly men. Manly men. Manly men. So, and that's what Solomon was, but this changed him. Child guidance, page 427. God designed that there should be a plain distinction between the dress of men and women and has considered the matter of sufficient importance to give explicit directions in regard to it. God has given explicit directions in regard. The same For the same dress worn by both sex, sexes would cause confusion and great increase in crime. Do we see that today? Amen. Yes. How many of you have been driving down the street, walking in the mall, walking in the grocery store, whatever, and you see somebody ahead of you and you're like, do I say good morning, ma'am, or hello, sir? Or You can't tell. There's often, I, I haven't been able to tell. The feminist movement was in full swing in Sister White's day. First testimony, page 421. There is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible and to fashion their dress very much like that of men but God pronounces it there's that word again abomination when men, men and women dress alike abomination God says no we're not to do that there's to be a plain distinction and we talked about it last week even when there were robes worn there was a plain distinction between the robes of men in the robes of women. There was a definite difference. Now, all of this blending is called the androgyny deception. Androgyny is the, the blending together of the male and female attributes. Androgyny, the combination of masculine and female characteristics. Sexual ambiguity may be found in fashion, gender identity, sexual identity, and sexual lifestyle. Women's rights activists, get this, are spiritualists. They're associated with spiritualism. We're just talking about a little bit of that. The essence of spiritualism is the lie told in Eden. What was it? You shall not surely die. You shall be as God. Now, the women's rights activists want to go higher. They want to usurp the position and they want to break that, that God said, your husband will rule over you. They say, absolutely not. You can kind of see them get the little head thing going. Defiance. Alright, the devil launched a, launched a massive attack against, attack against God's order in the 19, uh, 1850s when he inspired a group of modern restless Eves to rebel against God's principles. They were spiritualists. They decided that wearing men's clothing would give them power and authority. They coveted the role God had given to men. In the 19, 1850s, Elizabeth Smith Miller put on a short skirt over pantaloons. Her cousin, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and her friend, Amelia Bloomer, also wore similar attire. Part of their motivation was okay. They wanted to wear more healthful dress. This is taken from the book uh, cover by Amy McKnight as well. Now, this is Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, Cady Stanton. She was a spiritualist. She or organized a women's right, rights meeting uh, in 1848, I think, yeah, 48. She fought both in the church and society for equal rights for women. Now, look at this statement by her. Um, she says, when women understand that governments and religions are human inventions, that Bibles, prayer books, catechisms, and encyclical letters are all emanations from the brains of man, they will no longer be oppressed by the injunctions that come to them with the divine authority of thus saith the Lord. Do you remember when we talked in our first presentation about how the devil approached Eve in the Garden of Eden? Remember that I said that um, A.T. Jones uh, interprets it this way, that when the devil approached Eve, he used that, <laughs> that kind of nasally, <laughs> as God said, I can almost hear that in this woman's statement. Can't you? Mm -hmm. Listen to some of the other statements. This, though, was taken from the old landmark uh, blog press. The most elementary motive behind the women's rights movement of the mid-1800s was an effort to disrupt traditional 
patriarchy. That's the, the issue, your husband will rule over you. The desire to wear trousers was most certainly couched in a bitter war against male authority in both society and church. We're going to get straighter as we go along, so bear with me. This is taken from Panati's Extraordinary, Origin, Extraordinary Origins of Everyday Things. He's quoting, this is a quote from his book, Mrs. Bloomer turned the trousers into a uniform of rebellion, challenging the long tradition of who wears the pants in the family. Who in the family wore the pants. This is a quote directly from Amelia Bloomer. Listen carefully. <laughs> you can hear it. We shall no longer be answerable to the laws of God or man, no longer subject to punishment for breaking them. This was one of the ladies who established pants on women. Amelia Bloomer, in an angry response to a sermon referring to Deuteronomy 22.5, stated, It matters not to us what Moses had to say to the men and women of his time about what they should wear. I don't care what the Lord says. This particular style, designed by Amelia Bloomer, consisted of pants under a short dress. There were various styles. The knee-length dress uh, over pants outfit was called the American costume. They called it dress reform. Sister White refers to it repeatedly as so-called dress reform. The American costume was worn by women who rebelled against the Bible principle that the head of the woman, 1 Corinthians 11.3, is the man. Maybe we can catch these next few slides on the camera because I want you to see. You can look in the face of this woman. What do you see? She looks angry. She looks angry. She looks defiant, doesn't she? But look at the dress. Does that look... Uh, if you saw a lady dress like that, would you think she were, was immodest? No. No? No? What about this one? Would you think that is immodest? Yeah. Both of these are called the American costume. This is Dr. Mary Walker. Sister White spoke directly of this woman. Sister White says this is abomination. This is immodest. That's right. Volume 3 of Selected Messages 278. This is the style and influence of the American costume taught and worn by many at our home, Danceville, New York. It does not reach to the knee. I need not say that this style of dress was shown me to be too short. Volume 1 of the Testimonies again, 457. God would not have his people adopt this so-called reform dress, the American costume. It is immodest apparel, wholly unfitted for the modest, humble followers of Christ. Brothers and sisters, does this woman look immodest to you? She looks like a man. She looks like a man. Volume 1 again of Testimonies 457. With the so-called dress reform, there goes a spirit of levity and boldness just in keeping with the dress. Modesty and reserve seem to depart from many as they adopt that style of dress. You know what happens to me when I put pants on? I sit just like that. And the head thing comes to it, you know, the cocky attitude. It changes me as a person. I haven't had pants on and I don't know how. I think it's been at least 15 years. And now, even in the winter, my husband bought me some of those coverall things, you know, the insulated coverall things. Even now, when I put those on, I look like the Michelin man and I have my big down coat on. I have a big oversized jumper that I put on over that. Because even though you can't see my shape, it changes me. It changes my character. I cannot afford that. I can't afford it. Okay, that's the end of the pictures for now. Spiritualism began to decline in the 1870s, but it really just moved into the churches. And it remains there today. And we see it most recently manifested in the thrust for women's ordination. This, friends, is spiritualism. 
and I'm going on record saying that. Many of the people who push for these things hold to the Gnostic teaching that God is both male and female and you've got to blend those things into androgyny. We can't really understand God unless we see His feminine side. Well, does God has, have feminine attributes? Were one, women created in His image too? Yes, yes, He does have feminine attributes. But it doesn't mean that we blend the separateness that He put between men and when He created Adam and Eve. Right. It's not Adam and Steve. Not Adam and Steve, that's right. Okay, <laughs> created too. Okay. This also is why we are beginning to see the gender neutral spirit of prophecy books. This is wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's androgyny. It's the blending of these male and female characteristics. It is not right. Satan's mission is accomplished. Volume 1 of the Testimonies, 457. I saw that God's order has been reversed and His special directions disregarded by those who adopt the American costume. I was referred to Deuteronomy 22.5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, think about that American costume. Okay, you remember the pictures that I showed you? You remember, it's a dress over pants. Look at this. Those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called dress reform, who dress like that, might as well sever all connection with the third angel's message. Do you realize how serious that is? It's taken from 1T. 421. Do you realize how serious this is? What is the third angel's message? Revelations 14. Righteousness by faith. It's righteousness by faith. If you choose to dress according to those principles, sever yourself from the righteousness by faith message. I am not saying this, friends. This is Bible and spirit of prophecy. God means what He says. First Testimonies 136. As soon as any have a desire to imitate the fashions of the world that they do not immediately subdue, just so soon God ceases to acknowledge them as His children. I don't want God to cease to acknowledge me as His child. Don't despair though. If you did not know these things, Acts chapter 17, verse 30, what does it say? Read it with me. In the, times, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. God is calling us higher, sisters. And brothers, He's calling you higher too. It might mean some changes for some of the brethren. But ladies, right here in this group, it's going to mean some changes. What is the evolution of dress? I'd like to catch this on the camera. I want you to see the changes that have taken place in the dress of women uh, since the 1800s. This is taken from uh, the webpage, The Androgyny Deception, and I'll have the, the uh, address for that on the slide at the very end. Okay? 1870, the skirts were dragging the ground. Look at this. You know she's wearing some kind of corset. No woman has a skinny waist that skinny, at least I don't know. Anyway, 1880, you go on down, you go on down. Really about 1910, it, the dress was more sensible. The dress was a little higher, it didn't drag the filth of the streets. The waist was looser. This was more sensible. She had the boots with the little covering over the boots, like little gaiters. You've probably all seen those. Okay. What's wrong with this? Here. Okay. It's not dragging the floor, sweeping the floor. It's, it's not modest. modest. Okay, all right. Let's look at this. By the 1920s, we have the flappers coming. The hemline's gone up a little bit. Look at that. Mm -hmm. The waist is loose, but look at here. All right, 1930s. It's a little tight fitting there. Hemline's coming up. Boom. Look what happens in the 40s. Look at that hemline. See how the hemline came up? In mm -hmm. 1950s, look at that. We're going to follow this a little bit closer in, in some more slides. 1960s. If the miniskirt didn't get you, the color would kill you. 
<laughs> but this, the hemlock is way up here. And you know, I was listening to a sermon by um, J.R. Cofer, and he was talking about dress, and he said the person who invented the miniskirt invented it so that they could have S-E-X whenever they wanted. That was why this was invented. Okay? 1970, oops, sorry, 1970s, the pantsuits. We're getting a little more unisex here, the bell bottoms, I sure remember those. 1990s, pretty much you could see that. You could see a man or a woman wear that. Okay? Now, look at this. These are Seventh-day Adventist sisters now, all right? 1940s, look at the hemline. The legs are bare. 1950s, the hemlines are up. 1960s, even shorter. Okay? The stockings used to be thick, then they became thinner until today. Bare, logs, bare legs under knee-length skirts are common. When, with the legs exposed and only a thin covering, women have suffered with cold legs, right, sister? Suffered with cold legs for decades. When Satan introduced a fashion that would keep the legs warm, pants on women. <laughs> it seemed logical and sensible to accept it. So Satan seemed, seeks to correct a wrong fashion by introducing another wrong fashion. It's a common thing. This is from Health Reformer, May 1, 1872, paragraph 18. It's a common thing to see the dress raised one half yard or 18 inches, exposing an almost unclad ankle to the sight of gentlemen. But no one seems to blush at this immodest exposure. No one's sensitive modesty seems shocked. Why? What's that say? For the reason that it's customary. It is fashion, and for this reason it is endured. No outcry of immodesty is heard, although it is so in the fullest sense. In the 1950s, women were not allowed to wear pants at our Seventh-day Adventist schools and camp meetings. After the 60s, when many SDA young ladies wore miniskirts, church leaders accepted pants on women as a more modest alternative to miniskirts. Satan's strategy was clever. You see it? You see the progression? Yes, ma'am. We couldn't even wear a skirt when we roller skated. I mean pants. Yep. I'm, I'm going to, that's okay. I'd wear mine if I roller skated because I'd lose count of how many bruises I got too. But. All right, this is Silas Renagle. He has a blog, and this is a quote from him. I got this actually, I think, from uh, the um, covered book, Amy McKnight's book. The truth is a woman wearing jeans is something much bigger than simply the wardrobe choice of a single individual. Either consciously or unconsciously, it is a symbol of conformity with the modern utopian ideal which is based on the flawed premise that there is no ultimate difference between men and women. I want this on the camera. Now look what we have. Deuteronomy 22.5 goes both ways, brethren. I don't think anyone in this room is going to be like this. Clothes that are a thermometer of social custom tell us that the differences between man and woman are becoming less defined and rigid. With the affirmation of, a, of, women's, of women rights, a new androgynous model of being is emerging. This is the new being and that's emerging. Yeah, they wear them downtown yeah. right to the crutch. God sent a reform to this. God counteracted this. God intervened. First Testimony 524. In 1865, Ellen White wrote, God would now have his people adopt the reform dress, the SDA reform dress his reform dress. They called the American costume the reform dress, but she called it so-called. This is the real reform dress. Not only to distinguish him from the world as his peculiar people, but because reform in dress is essential to physical and mental health. Features of the reform dress. It was a blouse and loose jacket, a full gathered skirt, full and lined pants tapered and fastened about the ankle, which was the same color as the skirt. The skirt was eight to nine inches from the floor, and it was made after a consistent pattern. You've seen the Amish, the ladies, they all are made, they may be a little different color, except for the old order Amish, they're all black. 
But they're all made after the same pattern. God said we should be more consistent in the way that we dress as a people. 1881, the SDA reform dress, which was once advocated, proved a battle at every step. And the battle was because the rebellious hearts of the sisters, they would not accept this dress. They said, no, I will not dress like this. That's a picture of the reform dress that God wanted. I think it's kind of attractive, actually. Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 640. As our sisters would not generally accept the SDA reform dress, as it should be worn, another less objectionable style is now presented. It is free from needless trimmings, free from the looped up, tied back over skirts. It consists of a plain sack or loose fitting basque or bodice and skirt, the latter short enough to avoid the mud and filth of the streets. These are some examples that I scanned in from this book, Thy Nakedness. If you'd like to look at this, I'll have it up here after the class if you'd like to see it. I scanned those in. This is, this is where we are now. This is how the Lord wants us as sisters to dress. These are the features. You can find this in First Testimony. If you read 456 to 466, that chapter, Reform and Dress, it will have all these and more points that you can look at. It's made by no definite pattern or style. There's no precise length, but it's longer than the short dress and avoided the mud of the street. It's actually approximately ankle length. The feet are well clad. It's modest. It covers the arm with a loose fitting jacket to cover the upper body. It doesn't reveal the woman's form. It doesn't accentuate the woman's body. The legs are to be as well clad as with the reformed dress. The dress covered the plant pants immediately, uh, completely and it's loose fitting, simple and unadorned, unadorned, free from large plaids and figures. It's actually rather plain in cover, color. So if you have a dress that's got a huge picture of an orchid on the front, is that appropriate? No, it isn't. Neat, clean, and expensive, yet made of durable material, convenient, and it raised less prejudice. Okay. That's the end of the pictures for right now. Pastoral Ministry, page 63. Many who profess to believe the testimonies live in neglect of the light given. The dress reform is treated by some with great indifference and by others with contempt because there is a cross attached to it. For this cross, I thank God. It is just what we need to distinguish and separate God's commandment-keeping people from the world. The dress reform answers to us as did the ribbon of blue to ancient Israel. Volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 647. Fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. It's doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. Fashion. I'm not saying this, friends. It's right in the spirit of prophecy. You can see it for yourself. Now, the next few slides we'll catch on the camera. I want to ask you some questions. This is kind of a pop quiz based on what we've learned in these presentations. Is this how a Christian gentleman would dress? No. Would a Christian gentleman dress this way? No. What about this? No. Is that appropriate for a Christian no. gentleman? It's inappropriate for anybody. What about, is this, is this a proper model for the Christian woman? No. What about your children, your little girls? Is this a proper toy for your little girls to be exposed to, to learn what it means to be a woman? No. no. Look at this modern day American costume. I, I saw that picture and I thought that, that's, that's the modern day American costume. Pants with a short skirt underneath. I see this all the time, only this one actually is a little more modest. It comes down, you know. At least her hands are covered. Now I want to ask you this. What will you see if this sister bends forward? Everything. Her bust. Everything. <laughs> I have been in church congregations before with women who wear uh, have a, a collar like this on and they lean over to tell children's story and I can see their belly button. <laughs> and everything that stands between it and my eyes. Sisters, this is inappropriate. We should not dress like this. What about this? 
Where does this neckline draw your eye to? It, yeah, to the bosom, to the chest. All right. Now, this two finger breaths below the sternal notch. I read an article on Christian dress by a non Seventh Day Adventist sister, and she said, "Ladies, find your sternal notch, your your sternal this this notch right here at the top of your breastbone." Yeah. That little U-shaped thing. Find that. Put two fingers below it. If it's lower than that, it's too low. Hey, right. <laughs> that was a non-Seventh Day Adventist, sisters. A non-Seventh Day Adventist. Everything okay. is like that downtown. We can't find anything. Not everything. I can find it. Go to the thrift store. You find that old-fashioned stuff. Small sizes. <laughs> <laughs> what? What about this? Her limbs are exposed. Okay. What did we learn in the health health principles about that? What happens? Circulation. The circulation. The blood is forced. Oh, you can't, I can't dress like this. I'm so hot. Well, I guess so. Your limbs are chilled and the blood is forced into the trunk so that you feel hotter even though you have less clothes on. Okay. What about this? Is this appropriate attire for a woman living in the judgment hour? Your name could come up anytime in the judgment. Is this how you want to stand before the king? What about this? Where does this neckline? It's kind of high in the back, but where does this point to? Is that what happens if she bends over? They might fall off. What about the skirt? It's tight, short, and I almost guarantee you, if she turned around, it'd be slid up the back. Mm -hmm. I don't have a back picture, but <laughs> her limbs are uncovered. The shoes are unhealthful. We talked about high heel shoes when we talked about the posture. The jacket is masculine. Gentlemen, would this lady distract you if you were sitting in church? If she walked up front to take up the offering, the call for the offering? Yes. Would this distract you, brothers? Yep. Would it distract you? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Would it distract you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Would it distract you? What about these ladies? Brothers, would these ladies distract you if you were at church trying to worship? Would they distract you if you were walking down the street? You know what? I have to tell, share experience. I lived in uh, Fort Payne, Alabama, and I was thinking about moving back to um, closer to where my family lived. And a friend of mine and I went to Columbus, Georgia, which is probably twice the size of Bismarck. And I'm standing at a phone booth, talking, dressed like I dress. And my brother-in-law drove up. They didn't know I was in town. My brother-in-law just drove up, and there he sits in his van. And I said, how did you see me? I'm on a phone booth at a gas station in the middle of all these hundreds of people. And you know what he said to me? He said, a woman dressed modestly these days catches your eye. <laughs> so, now, Elsie asked a question last week. And I'm, it's, a, it's a question that I've had a lot of ladies ask me, or a lot of comments that a, lady, a lot of ladies have said. That's it. They've said, but I can't do this or that or what have you if I wear a dress. I can't do my work if I wear a dress. Well, here is a partial list of some of the things that I have been able personally myself to do in a dress. Gardening, horseback riding, fencing, change the oil in my Jeep, change the transmission filter and fluid in my Jeep, <laughs> built a shed in a barn, cut firewood with a chainsaw for over nine years, mowed grass, weed eated, gone hiking, climbed ladders, repaired roofing, trimmed horse hooves. How many of y'all fellas done that? I've done it in a dress. Trimmed horse hooves. Where was I? Plant trees and fruit bushes, gone canoeing, gone swimming, crossed a barbed bar wire fence. You can do it, ladies. Cross a barbed bar wire fence. When I first started dressing this way, I would watch ladies. I could not figure out how to sit on the floor in a dress. I just couldn't figure it out. But I watched them. And you know what? I can do it now with grace and dignity. I can even cook and clean in a dress. I can drive tractors. I can do whatever I need to do in a dress jumper or skirt and no I don't need to bungee jump I don't need to skydive etc I don't need to go repelling 
those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called dress reform might as well sever. What a dress if you wear it up, up, up uh, and you're shingling a roof, you can see all. <laughs> There's ways around that. I'll talk to you personally about that, but I've done it. My husband's been on the roof with me. He knows it's possible. You just make the guys go up the ladder first. <laughs> 1T, 421, those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called dress reform might as well sever all connection with the Third Angel's message. I do not want anyone in here severed from the Third Angel's Amen. message. Amen. And so this has been a, a straight down, and it will cause a shaking, I'm sure, in your life. Yes, sir. I think there's one thing that's been missing that's really done a church in. This has not been preached from the pulpit. I, I agree, it has not been preached yeah, from the pulpit. Yeah, we've got women that have their boobs hanging half out in church, <laughs> and that's a disgrace if they're in It is a disgrace. It is a disgrace. And so, yes, ma'am. Pastor Miller did try to yes, preach it in church. He did. Try it with your life. He tried to preach dress yeah. reform. In most churches these days, you risk your life just about if you preach this message. Yeah, because there's the, uh, the father of the girls that go in there and their boobs are hanging out. He didn't want one to step on their toes. Right. It's unfortunate, but you know, revival and reformation can begin with one person. Amen. There's a passage in uh, Councils to the Church, I think it's page 121, where it says when churches are revived, it's because one individual started it pays attention to it is written. One person, entire churches. So I want you to prayerfully consider these things. This is not our gospel. We will have some more presentation on this next week and by way of testimony, my husband and uh, another sister is going to share testimony, her personal testimony about this journey. And uh, and we'll leave this topic with you. You talk to the Lord about it. You wrestle with the Lord about it. And so I encourage you to come up higher. And these are the references that I told you that I would give you. We'll get this on the camera. We'll leave it up there for a while. So if you want to copy these down, you can copy these down. If you want to look at my book up here that I have, you're welcome to. Um, next week, when my husband and our friend share... We'll also have question and answer. So if you have questions, write them down, come to, with them, and, and uh, we'll try to address them. So let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We're so glad that you care enough about us to want to cover your precious jewels. I remember when my husband told me, Honey, do you have a blouse you can put on over that? It made me feel so special. I was his, and he wanted to cover me and cherish me. Lord, that's what you're doing to us. You cherish us, and you want to cover us because we're the apple of your eye. And so help us to see this in that way, Lord, that we're so cherished, we're so valued by you, that you want to keep your cherished treasure covered. You don't want us to be exposed to all the things that come with nakedness, either spiritually or physically. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would teach us your ways. For your sake we pray and we thank you.